Moses Elias Levy is a name that you don't even know. But you should. He was one of the earliest abolitionists. He was the first Jewish abolitionist. And this was in the early 1800s, long, long before the Civil War. He was an advocate for blacks and for Jews. Now, Florida has a very long history of human slavery. Over the first two centuries of the Spanish control of Florida, chattel slavery existed in law and in practice, yet most enslaved blacks were not imported. After Great Britain gained control of Florida in 1763, Enslaved Africans and their descendants provided the main labor source for the burgeoning agricultural economy in Florida. So much so that nearly half or over half of the populace in various areas of Florida was slaves. This is the seal of the state of the territory of Florida. In central Florida, where Disneyland is. During the lifetime of Moses Levy, chattel slavery ruled Florida. With anywhere from 30 to 60% of the area's population that was enslaved. An advertisement for runaway slaves might look like this because this is an actual one. Runaway slaves were hunted for profit throughout Florida and newspapers posted the rewards offered by plantation owners who were the contemporaries of Moses Elias Levy. This one reads $10 reward. Ran away from the subscriber, a Negro man named Charles and a Negro woman. The man is about 40 years old, the woman 38. The man is very black, about five feet, nine inches in height with the African marks on his face of his native country. The woman is about five feet nine and rather thick set. Any person returning them shall receive the above reward. And the reward was $10 which was a significant sum in those times. So it was very much profitable for people to hunt and trap and retrieve runaway slaves. Here's another actual newspaper ad. This one was, as we read at the bottom, from Andrew Jackson the person who would become our seventh president. He posted not a $10 reward, but a $50 reward for runaway slaves. And he was also Florida's first territorial governor. For runaway slaves and for Indians, Florida's plantation owners who were contemporaries of Moses Elias Levy, had no empathy. Andrew Jackson's newspaper ad read, in part, if taken out of the state, the above reward and all reasonable expenses paid and $10 extra for every hundred lashes any person will give him to the amount of 300. Now against this very dangerous backdrop of enslavement of black humans, Moses Elias Levy wrote a plan for the abolition of slavery, consistently with the interests of all parties concerned, 
in 1828, more than 30 years before the American Civil War. So Moses Elias Levy represents the intersection of Black history and Jewish history. In 1821, the United States acquired Florida and Alachua County, the home of Micanopy, was where Moses Elias Levy lived. Chattel slavery reigned amidst a virulent pro-slavery society. Nonetheless, Moses Levy courageously and vigorously sought to gradually abolish this inhumane system that comprised the very backbone of Florida's economy. As we see sugar plantations, we also see that women, babies, and men were auctioneered. This is Moses's book, A Plan for the Abolition of Slavery. In his visionary book, Moses Levy said this important question, shall we, to avoid such evils, continue the unjust system of slavery? No, not only justice, but policy forbids it for by continuing it, you necessarily produce a worse state of things, a state which threatens the earth with a scourge to retaliate on and punish the oppressors of the unhappy sons of Africa enslaved for nearly three centuries. This is what Moses Elias Levy described the slave as the unhappy sons of Africa, enslaved for nearly three centuries. Now in the midst of this horror, there were abolitionist societies. And Moses Levy said to them as he spoke in primarily Europe, Marriages amongst the blacks should be encouraged, even enforced by law. For how can we expect that religious or civilization can find its way among persons compelled to live as brutes? For surely conjugal affection, parental and filial love are the best guarantees for the good conduct of the subject. For slave masters unwilling to enforce marriages on their plantations, Levy's recommendation was, let a tax be imposed on all single persons in the colonies, and the planter will soon find it to his interest to promote marriages. He fervently believed that legal marriages for blacks would bring about the great end of abolishing slavery, destroying prejudice, and effectually improving the condition of millions of unborn souls. So even in the early 1800s, Moses Levy was very concerned about the millions of unborn black souls. He was very concerned that such a state is incompatible with a system of slavery and the vices to which tyranny and an abject debased spirit give rise. It can only be realized in a state of freedom when equal laws may be the patrimony of all classes of society, of the rich as well as of the poor. Equality under law is what Moses Elias Levy was fighting for. Very, very courageously, 
during a time when Florida was domineered by slavery. In his past, and at that time as well, Moses lived among slave traders whose traits were lower than vile animals, according to him. He rejected their ways for blacks and for all others. Moses Levy fervently believed that religious education in particular was the key to moral citizenry. So he believed in teaching all children, both genders and slave children, as well as all other children in free public education. He said at the age of 21, children properly educated would be considered free, having received thorough training of the mind to make the will of God the mainspring of action. Now, besides a rescuer of Africans, in America, he was a rescuer of the Jewish people. He had been born in Morocco and displaced through persecution to Gibraltar. He also lived in various places in the Caribbean, St. Thomas, Puerto Rico. He had lived, he lived in the United States, in Paris, in England and moved from wealth to poverty and wealth to poverty back and forth during his lifetime. In 1822, he spent $18,000 on his plantations while continuing to work to attract Jewish refugees from Europe who were being persecuted. So already in the early 1800s and really throughout European history, and throughout Jewish history, there was persecution of the Jews. Levy bought at first a thousand acre sanctuary nestled in Florida's vast wilderness. For persecuted Jews from Europe. He was a philanthropist with great empathy for his own people, the Jewish people, and with great empathy for black people who were not his own people, but he loved them nonetheless. Long before Moses Levy ever traveled to his intended residence in Florida, he began to negotiate purchases of vast tracts of land for the, his beloved Jewish people. He went to England in 1816 to sell his plans to Jews in Britain. He lived from 1822 until 1830 in what is known as Pilgrimage Village or Pilgrimage Plantation which he set up as a refuge for persecuted Jews from Europe. Now again, this was in the early 1800s. The Holocaust was not until the mid 1900s. So this was well before, well more than 100 years before the Holocaust. Moses Elias Levy was a master builder. He built from scratch the 45 mile road from St. John's River to Micanopy, 45 miles through the swamps, alligators, snakes, bears, hordes of mosquitoes, even today, this is what Micanopy looks like. There is a 
beautiful natural area called Nicanope. Moses Levy was a master planner. So he planned pilgrimage plantation and another plantation called Hope Hill. He also planned a Jewish boarding school. According to Moses Levy, will not the religious mind be apt to perceive the retributive hand of justice, preparing a scourge to chastise the whites for the oppression they have for so many centuries been guilty of towards the unfortunate sons of Africa. The divine law was not made for Israel alone, but for the whole human race to instill in man a habitual desire to do the commandment or the will of God in everything. That being the aim and end of the law. Let us conceive of the families of one town or village consisting of parents and children, betrothed youths, supporting the aged, marching forward in exaltation to Jerusalem, the mountain of the Lord's house, the habitation of his holiness. So Levi wanted to bring together the world of blacks and whites, Jews and slaves, and everyone else. In 1860, after he had passed away, Florida's population was nearly 44% enslaved. Nearly 44% enslaved. Less than 1,000 free blacks lived in Florida at the onset of the Civil War. There were most by far of the blacks who were enslaved. Moses Levy was a free education advocate. Amongst the dearest priorities of the life of Moses Elias Levy was the matter of free public education. This was unheard of, absolutely unheard of for all children. That was unheard of, including children born into slavery. That was unheard of, including girls. That was an unheard of. Promoting a practical, substantial, and religious education that should be given to the rising generation, both of the whites and blacks, for the purpose of abolishing slavery in the civilized world by means of education. So what was the ticket to abolish slavery? In the concepts of Moses Elias Levy, education. And we're still working on that now. The emancipation of the slaves should not be aimed at until they are better capable of enjoying and of deserving their freedom. In other words, it would be a curse to them otherwise if they are not educated in order to navigate the world. Moses Elias Levy loved these people. He himself was self-trained to learn different pursuits and habits than the usual ones. Levy wrote that for anyone to prevent the introduction of any more slaves and to report any infraction of orders to abolish slavery, his life would pay the forfeit. Nay, he dares not even notice the prohibited Africans being landed before him. This I know from experience. So he wanted to globally prohibit all slave trading. In May 1828, 
Moses Levy in a profound oration on religion and education, challenged a meeting of Jews and Christians as to what kind of results they could expect from the contemporaneous systems of education. Was it not absurd to suppose that after casting the mind into the mold of heathen principles and fostering the affections according to the same model, after infusing into the mind the obscene principles of polytheism and firing it with vainglory, was it not absurd to suppose that the principles of revelation would have their due effect in producing obedience to the will of God. Moses Levy fervently promoted free public education for every child based upon the teachings of the Bible. To provide every student with a firm, moral, divinely based foundation for his future success in life. At the time, the principle of free education for all children was revolutionary. But to him, it was a sacred cause of education. A sacred cause of education. Especially given that Florida was one of the poorest and least populated regions in the entire United States. In keeping with his commitment to all children, Levy helped to found the Florida Education Society. This was a man of vision and action, which is a rare combination. The Florida Education Society was determined that of 340 children between the ages of five and 15, the poorest 204 would not be left to grow up in ignorance and its attendant consequences. So what did Moses Levy do? He actively solicited for a free public school in St. Augustine, which the building is still there in St. Augustine. The very first of its kind in Florida opened in 1832. But it was unwelcome. By 1831, the year before, Levy was appointed education commissioner by the governor. In the decade before he was appointed as Florida's first education commissioner, Levy circulated a three-page leaflet regarding the creation of a boarding school for Hebrew youth. So as hard as Levy was fighting and fighting and fighting for black education, he was fighting for Hebrew or Jewish education as well. Wherein both boys and girls would learn the Hebrew language, useful arts and science and basic farming skills for the boys so that they could have a living. For his own four children, two girls and two boys. Levy expanded their education in boarding schools, offering English grammar, arithmetic, history, geography, French, reading and writing. When education of girls was thought to be radical. So again, Moses Elias Levy was anything but an elitist. He included everyone in his plans and his policies and his practices for education. 
He was an author and an orator. Levy warned in 1828 the retribution which justice demands. It is not only necessary to abandon the system of persecution and oppression hitherto pursued against the blacks, but to turn that very system of slavery into an instrument of blessing for them. It can only be felt by those who are operated upon by the principles of the revealed word of God. This was a Renaissance man extraordinaire. He had been born into the lap of luxury in Morocco, but early in his childhood was persecuted, forced to, into exile, and bounced from country to country to country. And he eventually made a fortune, which he lost, and then had to bounce back and forth between wealth and poverty. He was a fervent Jew. In the same year that he published a plan for the abolition of slavery, he delivered an extraordinary speech in London declaring the divine law was designed to furnish men universally with a motive of action altogether independent of any which his own nature was capable of furnishing for the purpose of regenerating him to his original perfection through the sole operation of the word of God. The divine law was not made for Israel alone, but for the whole human race. In the view of Moses Levy, the poor and the rich, the master and the slave, and even the stranger, banished all distinctions regarding each other as members of the same family to appear before the Lord. Thus, in every call, in every social duty, in every political relation, in every temporal interest, the word of God was the spring of action and the cement which united them together. The poor and the stranger, as well as the rich and the homeborn, could obtain redress. Thus the word of God was the instrument of man's generation in every action of life. Moses Elias Levy was a master builder. He built the 45 mile road through the swamps from the St. John's River to Micanopy. He was a master planner. He built two refuges for Jews in Central Florida. He was a writer. Here's Letters to the Jews, a copy of a speech that he delivered. At a meeting of Christians and Jews in London, May 1828. He had beautiful, exquisite handwriting. Just exquisite. This is a map of the land he bought. He bought, uh, sight unseen, 100,000 acres of central Florida. Sight unseen. And again, he wrote beautifully 
He lived amidst the constant threat in Central Florida of Seminole Indian Wars for 13 years between the First and Second Seminole Wars in which many thousands of American lives were lost when the Seminoles skillfully employed guerrilla warfare tactics. See, the US military was not accustomed to guerrilla warfare, but the Seminole Indians were. There were pledges Here's a million dollar pledge to fund Jews on agricultural colonies in Russia. But Moses Elias Levy didn't want to send or leave Jews in Russia. In 1818 was the first Seminole War. And shortly after that, Moses Elias Levy moved to Florida. Again, sight unseen. In 1818, 18, two Seminole chiefs were captured by Andrew Jackson's forces. By a ruse of flying the British flag to lure the Indians to them. On March 10, 1821, General, at the time, Andrew Jackson, was appointed to become the U.S. Commissioner to take possession of Florida. Shortly thereafter, in July, Spain gave Florida to the U.S. Jackson, ceded Florida, and Jackson resigned. 1835 was the Second Seminole War. These were very, very, very bloody wars. The war left more than 1,500 soldiers and countless American civilians dead. This is Chief Micanopy, for whom the current village town of Micanopy is named. Now in 1835, Pilgrimage Plantation was burned down during the Second Seminole War. Eighteen fifty five was the third Seminole War. But Moses Elias Levy had already passed away by then. This is a map of Florida in 1837 and of Micanopy, the pilgrimage plantation site. And as you can see, these battles and forts in the Seminole Wars were scattered throughout Florida. 